Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest European Parliamentary Research Service book talk. I'm Anthony Teasdale from the EPRS, and it's a great pleasure to welcome our guests and also those who are following us online for this event. Today, the 9th of November, is the 31st anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. So it's a huge moment in European history, and of course, with the passage of time, its significance has become ever greater. And today we're going to be talking about a, a book which came out recently uh, by Professor Christina Spohr of uh, the London School of Economics uh, called Post Wall, Post Square, Rebuilding the World Order After 1989. And this is a, a really great book for those of you who've not yet had a chance to see or, or read it. It's, it's well worth looking at in detail. It's a fantastic historical account of the events of those particular years surrounding the collapse of, of communism in Central Eastern Europe, 1989, 1990, but also it carries the story forward. That's one of the distinctive features of the book. And equally, it draws comparison with what was happening on the other side of the globe, in Tiananmen Square and more generally in China. It also talks a great deal about what occurred in Russia. It's an attempt in effect of a kind of global history of that period and one that uh, we see uh, as ever more significant in retrospect. So we're delighted to have with us today the author of that book, Christina Spohr. Uh, she's Professor of International History at the London School of Economics and most recently she's been the Helmut Schmidt Distinguished Chair at SAIS, the School for Advanced uh, International Studies at Washington DC. Her book, the German version of the book, uh, Avendicide, recently won the prize as the best political science book published in German for the year 2020. And it's far from being her first book. She recently published uh, on the same subject, Exiting the Cold War, Entering a New World with Daniel Hamilton of SAIS. And she's uh, portrayed the role of Helmut Schmidt, who's a namesake, as it were, she's the holder of the a distinguished chair at Sysov in a, in, a, in a kind of biographical portrait of Schmidt's role in foreign policy, the global chancellor. So uh, welcome, Christina. Thank you very much for joining us today. And on the other side of the Atlantic, we have a very distinguished commentator who's going to give his perspective on the book. And I have to say it was Bob Zellick, uh, the individual concerned, who pointed me in the direction of this book and resulted in my myself uh, reading it. Uh, Bob Zellick is former president of the World Bank, a role he held from 2007 until 2012, and had previously been deputy US Secretary of State and the US Trade Representative, and has a fantastic global vision, if you like, both of politics and economics. And in this particular context, a very special role too, because at the time of the fall of the wall, he was special counselor and undersecretary at the State Department, a key advisor on these issues uh, to the then US Secretary of State, uh, James Baker. So welcome, Bob, from Washington, and thank you very much for getting up so early to join us on this occasion. We already have 58 people online and they're eager to hear more about the book. So I'm going to go straight over uh, to uh, Christine to ask her to tell us about it. And if while she's talking or Bob's talking after, because Bob's going to give his comment and critique, if you like, of the book immediately thereafter, please, if you would like to ask a question, please feel free to do so. And you can do that in the Q&A function, which exists for those of you who are on devices in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Over to you, Christina. Yeah, so 1989 and today the 9th of November, um, when the world dramatically changed as the Berlin Wall fell. But we must also remember, of course, that 1989 was the year when protests turned to massacre in Tiananmen Square. And my book offers, um, I would argue, a bold novel interpretation of 1989 as a global revolutionary upheaval but it shows also how in this aftermath, in the aftermath of these revolutions, a new world order was forged without major conflict. And that is really um, special in history, especially if we look at it in European history, if you consider 1648, 1815, 1918, 1945, the map tended to be redrawn completely, topographical change happened after wars. But in 1989, 1991, the world changed peacefully. And one of the questions is, how was this possible? 
And I thought also there's a very inspiring quote um, by James Baker, the then Secretary of State of the United States, who said, if 1989 was the year of sweeping away, 1990 must become the year of building anew. And that made me think that we really need to also look at how these forces from below, the people in the street that protested, that, that demanded freedom in the Central and Eastern European states and also in the Soviet Union, as that became possible, um, how important leaders were in the management of change to channel to channel these forces and to peacefully bring about a new world order as the world exited the Cold War. That is sort of the post-war story, our Euros, Euro-Atlantic story, um, if you so wish. And on the other side, we have the post-square story, the story of what happened in Asia, in particular in China, because there we see how protest turn to massacre in Tiananmen Square on the 4th of June 1989, which incidentally was the same day as the first three Polish elections. Um, so when the Poles went to the polls that morning, um, they also had to deal with television images uh, from China where they saw what it meant when force was applied and protest brutally suppressed. So there's this duality that actually changed uh, and shaped uh, the end of the Cold War, and I would argue um, has shaped uh, and is shaping the world to, to the present. Now, how do I go um, about this kind of project? Um, my, my book is based on, on governmental sources and party political sources interview from a vast array of states from America to the Soviet Union, um, what, is, what has become available also from the Chinese side or rather from uh, also uh, British, French embassies, uh, in Beijing, and you know, who, who witnessed uh, the situation on, on, on the ground, from Estonia uh, to Germany, um, a, a lot of different um, European materials and also from Eastern Europe. So I tried to understand the different perspectives while developing my argument, how this multi-level story has to be explained and how the agency of the leaders interacted with structural changes and people power. So in a nutshell, so let's transport ourselves back to this period. And, um, you know, given the present day, um, let us look at this through a quote that I want to, you know, 10 seconds uh, spend with you, what George Bush Sr., then president of the United States, said in 1992, um, as he looked back after the election uh, that he just lost. He said, destiny, it has been said, is a matter of chance. It's a matter of choice. It is not a thing to be waited for, it is a thing to be achieved. And we can never safely assume that our future will be an improvement over the past. Our choice as a people is simple. We can either shape our times or we can let the times shape us. And shape us they will at a price frightening to contemplate morally, economically and strategically. This is what he said on the 15th of December, 1992, and at a speech in Texas when he left office. And you have to think that here is a man who had been in power from 88 to 1992. And when you look now back, you would say it had been a pretty successful present presidency managing what I would call the hinge years, these, these years of massive change on a global scale. But he had just lost the election to Bill Clinton, and he was trying to come to terms with political defeat and that humiliation, but also, um, you know, looking back, what to make of these four years that had just gone? What had happened in this whirlwind uh, of his time in, in the White House? And I've also mentioned this because I want us to think of the challenge that the leaders um, faced then and that in some ways the choices they made, how it has affected us today. So just a few key markers before I will break down my brief talk in, into three areas. What, what was this period about? 1989, Bush had just entered the office uh, and we are looking at um, this also through the lens of France, 1789, 200 years since the French Revolution. This is a revolutionary year throughout Central and Eastern Europe when there was a sort of sense that the Ancien Regime um, of communist dictatorship and the command economies was being swept away. The Soviet bloc was melting away. Something that had been frozen in place ever since World War II was gone. And the symbolic moment indeed 
was at fall of the Berlin Wall. The Eastern European states underwent total economic and political transformation. They underwent electoral revolutions as well, if you so want, after, for example, the round table events in, in Poland. And they were seeking to make their new capitalist democracies viable and sustainable with Western aid. The Warsaw Pact and the Comecon dissolved. The Red Army began its withdrawal from the Soviet, former Soviet satellite states and even from um, Eastern Germany. And this was completed by 1994. In 1991, the Soviet Union disintegrated peacefully, but Yugoslavia imploded violently, yeah, descending even into a genocidal wars. The European community was metamorphosing into the European Union due to the Maastricht Treaty, and NATO was establishing a new cooperation council so that the West could embrace the East, so that it could build a community of nations all the way from Vancouver to Vladivostok. That was sort of the spirit of this time, these two, three years. And in Bush's final year in 1992, what I would call in my book that post-war Europe, that was also the process beginning of reunification um, if you saw one, Genscher also spoke, German Foreign Minister Genscher, of the reunification of Europe. Um, the Central and Eastern European countries and the Baltic states and many of the former Soviet republics, including Russia, looking west for financial support, but also for access to the Western organization, the so-called integration into the formerly Western structures. And by that, I mean EU, NATO and the G7, for example, all of which, as part of this process themselves, would undergo consequential change. And the same happens also with the GUT. You must remember the Uruguay rounds and how that turned into the World Trade Organization then in, in the 1990s. And for many contemporaries, this was a sort of time when there was a sense it's a trend of Westernization, it's a triumph of the West, um, something is happening on a global plane, and, you know, the spirit of Wilsonianism um, was, was also uh, invoked. So it was also what some called, you know, Francis Fukuyama called the end of history. Um, I talked already this question, triumph of the West, certainly perhaps a unipolar moment um, after the Soviet Union had collapsed. And the idea was that um, also under US leadership, there would be shaped a peaceful norms-based world with a lot of um, emphasis also on the United Nations as an international body, as one of the shapers. So there was this full, um, the world was full of the spirit of optimism, of this new global order. And why was there so much optimism? And also, what were the weaknesses and, and flaws uh, of this post-war world? Now, before I'm going to talk about that, I mentioned this duality. And we must remember um, what had happened in China and how China took a different exit from the Cold War, because in some ways, um, you know, communism was reinvented in a different way. And this leads me to my second point. As we're looking at this duality, let's look at the duality through um, what I would call three important verbs of what is happening in these hinge years, and why one might say that some of the aspects of these revolutions were actually conservative. Let's look at this change of the world through the verbs conserving, modifying and reinventing. And let me begin with this idea of the duality. You know, what, what happened in the Soviet Union and what happened in China? So in the Soviet Union, um, if we think about this idea of um, the political implications of reinvention, then let's think about what did Gorbachev first want to do? He wanted actually to preserve the Soviet Union. He wanted to make it more viable. He wanted to reform and revitalize the USSR and thereby reposition it in, in the world in, in a peaceful competition with the West. He had said, you know, there can be competition between the two systems, but it has to be peaceful. He had, in that sense, clear and broad goals, but he had little idea how to achieve them. And he quickly became more radical. And what do I mean by that? That he felt that true restructuring, economic restructuring, had to go hand in hand with political liberalization. So perestroika went hand in hand with glasnost, and that I would argue is already part of an adaptation process. You know, initially um, he sets out to preserve, but this change, and then he begins to adapt. 
And as part of this vision, he wanted to create also a common European home. And by that, he already effectively addressed the Eastern European communist regimes, whom he also wanted to instigate to change. He stressed that he did not want to use the Brezhnev doctrine, yeah, the abolition of the use of force. He said that at the UN in Manhattan in 1988, in December. His future vision for American-Soviet relations was one of superpower cooperation and partnership despite ideological differences. Relations that went beyond the literal peaceful coexistence, that it would be undergirded by arms reductions, conventional forces treaties, the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. All that falls into his time, 1990, 1991. He promoted universal norms. He wanted um, freedom of choice. This is by which he also effectively spoke to the Eastern Europeans, in fact, more to the people even than the regimes. So he adapted and modified more and more at home, but then also as he got challenged at home um, by the hardline communists, he actually began to swing to them and he began to realize that it might not just leave, lead to the unraveling of the Soviet bloc, the old as you know, has been argued by historians in the Cold War context, that empire by imposition in Eastern Europe, but after 1989, he tried to hang on to power and control inside the Soviet Union. And so we see the shift uh, to the hardline communists. And he begins to end up having to preside over the destruction as a disintegration of the Soviet Union, in particular uh, after the coup. So what we see is we never really get to the stage of reinventing communism. And the Soviet Union collapses. And with that, that state in some ways disappeared from the map. And we got a rump state of Russia and the successor states. Now, in China, it's different because Deng and the party leadership had, had um, embarked on a path of economic liberalization, economic reform, and they couldn't prevent soaring inflation. That leads also to protest in the late 1980s and the, and the ra radical change uh, demands for change of the regime. Um, and it is an escalating domestic crisis after, after the point. And of course, the Chinese leadership look at, looks at this in comparison to the erosion of Soviet communism in Eastern Europe. And what we see in China is the reassertion of control with the use of force. We see that one party rule will be conserved, secessionist nationalism will be stumped out. And after a brief reactionary period, um, after the summer of 1989 under um, uh, Li Peng, um, we see then the emergence later of um, Jiang Zemin and the economy would be moving towards a capitalist system while the one party state, the Communist Party, uh, would survive. So while Gorbachev fails in remaking the union, one could say the Chinese succeeded in remaking China as a one party communist state continuing while pushing forwards to economic liberalization and bringing China into the fold of, of, as a world economy and thereby pushing China towards becoming uh, a, a global economic power. So here we have this duality. And in fact, Deng Xiaoping had said in 1989, another interesting quote, we don't care what others say about us. The only thing we really care about is a good environment for developing ourselves. So long as history eventually proves the superiority of the Chinese socialist system, that's enough. You could say perhaps that was quite prescient if you think about where we are today. And now a, a third brief example, because that ties in with the architecture of Europe. If we look at Germany again there, you know, the German question that actually is a story of revolution, of change, in some ways like elsewhere in Eastern Europe, but in other ways completely different because it internationalized the problem because it was about the unification of these two states in, in the heart of Europe, which brought about the change of the European architecture. Here too, we can see how it's about conserving, modifying and reinventing. And what do I mean? In some ways, the way unification came about once the East Germans were in the streets, once they didn't anymore want to support a reform of their own country, but they looked best. In contrast to other Eastern Europeans, the East Germans could always run to that mirror image of a state. And what you see is not some kind of nasty German brown nationalism. What you saw was sort of a nationalism based on the dreams of freedom and prosperity and the Deutschmark. And in fact, in a, in a very 
short nutshell, brief nutshell story, we can say what happens is that effectively as a state form after the Eastern Europe, uh, after the East Germans have voted for effectively Helmut Kohl's sister party in the March 1990 elections, in their first three elections, they vote effectively for the party that stands for the West German Chancellor. And unification is being brought about by East Germany's absorption as a state into West Germany, its absorption into the Deutschmark zone, and its absorption automatically in that sense also directly into the EU and NATO because West Germany, of course, was already a member. But I mean that in a sort of positive sense because it comes out of the choice of the people in that effectively electoral revolution. Uh, it is not something that is now, 30 years later, told as a story of a hostile takeover, of a Western imperialist takeover. In the same way that when you now look at what happens in Eastern Europe, the narrative is about you know, giving up the nation uh, in this post-national EU construct, of somehow giving up the sovereignty that was just you know, hard fought for. In fact, if you look at what happens, and this can be so nicely told through the German story, the fact that Germany continue to be anchored in EU and NATO, and that in fact that German unification process, in particular through the Franco-German relationship, also catalyzed the EC forward to becoming the EU economic and political deepening. It is actually a positive integrationary process, and the Eastern Europeans knocked on the doors of both EC and NATO. Also that Germany remained in NATO was a compromise by the Soviets and the Americans. The Soviets in some ways even wanted the Americans to remain a European power because it would safeguard them against a potential reawakening Germany. The, fear, the fears from World War II were so strong that actually the anchoring of Germany in these organizations was the main priority. So the way the European architecture then evolved as the Eastern Europeans had just gotten the freedom to choose, which Gorbachev had consented to them, was to choose those very organizations and knocking at the door. And in fact, you can see that, you know, the Western Europeans were quite hesitant at which point to do this. So when you look in terms of the timetable, EU enlargement to Eastern Europe only in 2004, NATO enlargement in 1997. By that point, the Soviet Union had collapsed and even Yeltsin was looking to talk with the Western Europeans uh, and, and the Americans. So what I'm trying to say, here was a period of partnership, uh, of a cooperative spirit, where everybody was looking for a win-win situation. The difficulty was, and that's where the, the complications come in, is when the Soviet Union collapsed, you couldn't anymore have this new world order that Bush had pronounced, that you would have these two cooperative superpowers that functioned so well, for example, in the first Gulf War, when under UN auspices, a coalition of the willing pushed out Iraq that had invaded Kuwait. In other words, one held onto the territorial integrity. That functioned really well. Then the Soviet Union collapsed. Then that world order with these two cooperative pillars didn't function anymore, and it had to be reinvented yet once more. But at the same time, Europe was grappling with Yugoslavia, and that is a very important story in my book, because the EU that was just emerging was no uh, foreign political power in its own right. Americans were thinking about a peace dividend, should they actually pull out of Europe and that let the Europeans have, the Europeans have their hour of Europe? Or should America as a European power involve itself? And if it did so, of course, it would want to talk to the Russians about this. So in some ways, you see, you know, a lot of uncertainty in this time and um, how to, um, you know, engage with something completely unexpected, namely warfare at Europeans' own borders, just when everybody's also trying to manage this post-Soviet space um, with these new countries and the world in flux and the worries about rogue states such as Iraq or North Korea, because I had mentioned, you know, the duality of the exit from the Cold War. And this is my final point. The world economically had thought maybe it would be a Pacific century with the rise of Japan as a world economic power. Well, that bubble also burst in 1991. But what also emerged was that North Korea was popping up as a nuclear force. 
And so you see this language and the emergence of worries over rogue states who are not anymore under the umbrella of the Soviet. So the certainties you may have had with Soviet client states disappear. And the world that looked so optimistic and positive had already these seeds of great uncertainty and worrying developments that as time would go on would affect the way and um, you know the structure, the world order um, would evolve. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Christina, for that really uh, excellent survey of those events and some extremely important insights there, which you shared with us, uh, taking us back so vividly to that period between say 88 and 92, which has so much shaped the world in which we've been living over the last three decades. Thank you. Uh, I particularly liked your phrase um, that about Gorbachev that uh, we never got to the stage, he, or he never got to the stage of reinventing communism. Uh, and it uh, reminds one of the famous um, adage of de Tocqueville, you know, the most dangerous moment for any bad government is when it seeks to reform its ways. Now over to Washington and to give his insight into this, both on the basis of reading the book and also living those events very personally at the highest level. Bob Zellick. Well, thank you, Anthony, for the invitation and for the opportunity to be here with Christina. Um, I can't think of a better person to serve as the Helmut Schmidt chair in, uh, at SICE, and I hope that we get her back from, uh, from London. Uh, this is a very important book, um, not only because of Christina's important research, but also offering new and, and significant insights about the 1989 92 period that have been overlooked. So uh, today I want to try to draw out five of them. First, um, as Christine emphasized, this book provides a global perspective on the end of the Cold War. Indeed, I think it might be the first book that provides such a perspective. And therefore, uh, it's important in looking beyond the center stage of Europe and Russia that most historians are focused on. Christina also draws out attention to events across the Asia Pacific. She mentioned China, but she also talks about the creation of APEC, uh, the Gulf War in the Middle East, uh, and North America, uh, which is often overlooked even by Americans. Um, and so in doing so, uh, she weaves uh, economics and politics with a security into the historical tapestry. Second, uh, as the book's title foreshadows and as she emphasized, Christina draws a very important comparison between the paths of China and the former Soviet Union. She examines how the two communist powers dealt with the challenges of 1989, which certainly have major implications for today. Both Deng and Gorbachev unleashed reforms during the 1980s uh, without full appreciation of the consequences. And when reform veered out of control in China, Deng's forces crushed it. And then he had to reinvent Chinese communism after three years of Li Pong's clampdown. And this is very important to understand China today because the Soviet Union's collapse still casts a long shadow over Beijing. Many of us in Europe and the United States see the events of 1989 in a historical perspective in China, they're very real. When Xi assumed power in 2012, he created a documentary film about the end of the Soviet Union and he directed all the party cadres to see it. Now, if you had prepared such a film in Germany, Gorbachev would have been the hero that helped end the Cold War. The Chinese version's a little different. Gorbachev's the fool that abandoned the Communist Party, led to the breakup of his country, and the not so subtle message is it won't happen here. Now, Russia under Putin has veered closer to the Chinese design of trying to seek great power status in international politics. But also from a historical sense, the events in China in June of 80, 1989 are very important in understanding US policy in Europe in 1989, 1990. So <clears throat> I had just returned from a very successful NATO summit meeting uh, in May of 89. And on that weekend, we saw the images come out of Tiananmen Square. And as Christina points out, Gorbachev never spoke out against Tiananmen Square. 
So in the months that followed, we had to proceed very carefully in trying to support German unification, the freedom in Central and Eastern Europe, and even uh, change within the Soviet Union, because we were always concerned about things that could go wrong. Third, <coughs> I think this context helps explain the so-called conservative approach that uh, Bush and Baker took to what Bush called the New World Order, or others might call a new international design. They were actually leading a transformational change that was cloaked in garments of the past. They were relying on workable, experienced transatlantic and European institutions that had been built up over 40 years. I think Christina refers to conserving, adapting, reinventing. I had said they adapted, supplemented, and even expanded these institutions. What's important to realize about this is this was not a restoration of the old order like that of the Holy Alliance in Europe at the, uh, at the early part of the 19th century. Now, some writers have been very critical of this adaptation because they argue the United States should have closed down the old in favor of a new collective security model. Um, and this is a view that is driven primarily by people focused on Russia. I think it was totally unrealistic. Um, all the countries uh, in Europe uh, and Asia wanted reassurance in 1989 and 90. They certainly didn't want experimentation. Um, and there's an element that Christina explores that uh, is going to be very important for future historians because there's a view quite common now in the United States about Bush's so-called pause in 1989. And this is driven by a perspective about Gorbachev. There's a view that uh, people wanted Bush to engage Gorbachev more quickly. What they ignore is that Bush and Baker's logic was to put the alliance first because of the sensitivities in German about short range nuclear missiles after the removal of intermediate range missiles, there was a very divisive issue in NATO. And Bush comes up with a very bold conventional forces proposal, again, ignored by most historians, um, that sets the stage for NATO coming together, pushing the short range missile off. And in practical terms of pause, what you see is that um, in the first five months of the Bush administration, he not only visits Japan after Hirohito's death, a very significant step because he had been an aviator in the Pacific in World War II. He visits China. Baker negotiates a, a court about Nicaragua and Central America, come up with a bold conventional forces proposal. You have a very successful NATO summit. All this is within the first four or five months. Compare that to any other administration and you have to ask yourself some pause. But what it reflects is their focus on the alliance before Moscow. And this was not only a view of their obligations to Germany and alliance partners, but it was a critical notion about how to be most effective in dealing with the changes in the Soviet Union. You had to line up your allies first. By the way, there's some insights one can draw on that for dealing with China. But the experience of 1989 also suggests that one can modify and adapt existing cooperative institutions, even in the face of very great changes. So in rather simplistic terms, it's easier to break things than build them up. So be careful what you break. Um, fourth, Christina's book invites discussion of the possible power that might have emerged from 1989-92, but didn't. These were heady years for Europeans. Um, I recall as the U.S. Sherpa for the Economic Summit 1992, chaired by Germany, that Horst Kohler, who was then the State Secretary of the German Finance Ministry, later Germany's president, actually was quite smug at the Economic Summit preparations in 1992. We were facing a difficult re-election. We had some sensitive issues, and I was rather unimpressed by Kohler's sort of lack of flexibility after what the U.S. had done to help Germany. The German foreign ministry had a different position, but this was also a harbinger of the future. As Christina points out, uh, European dreams were shattered in the Balkans. One might argue that the global financial crisis of 2008-2009 um, uh, stressed this problem again, and one would look today to see how Germany is adapting to it. But as Christina points out, I think the challenge extended uh, much deeper because the Europeans of 
believe strongly in the power of a peaceful community of nations, legal regimes, shared sovereignty, and peaceful protests from below. It's attractive, but I don't think history has borne it out. Um, I recall uh, on a visit to Berlin in 2019, the time of the anniversary of the fall of the wall, seeing historical explanations on poster boards outside the Brandenburg Gate. And it was quite striking, the view of history that was being presented. It was all the story of the power of the powerlessness. Now, this was true in part, particularly with the courage of East Berliners and East Germans. But as Christina's book points out, unification required a extremely unusual international context and support. So today, international politics are again in flux. And the European Union is an economic and sometimes political actor. But the question that all of you will face is, can it frame a strategic perspective? Or does it risk, as Henry Kissinger has warned, becoming a strategic appendage of Eurasia? Fifth and finally, uh, Christina revives the importance of the year 1992. And this is very significant because all historians ignore 1992. But just consider what happened in that year. This was the year of Yeltsin's rise, so the challenge of what would be the future of Russia. The United States pressed successfully for a big further reduction in nuclear weapons and the safety for the nuclear weapons in the former Soviet republics. And imagine what the world would be like if those were much more dispersed. The United States, Canada, and Mexico completed NAFTA, which was intended to create a foundation for a new North American partnership based on deeper integration as Europe was pursuing, but with respect for sovereignty and independence. So this was not a shared sovereignty model of the European Union. Because of the historical relationships among the United States, Canada, and Mexico, all three valued their independence and sovereignty, and this had to be managed while pursuing integration. The United States and the EU reached terms on agriculture uh, for the Uruguay round negotiations in December of 1992. And that broke the back of the difficult issues that created the basis for closing the Uruguay round and creating the World Trade Organization. As Christina mentions, Japan, the trading state that was supposed to be the model of the future, started to begin a serious slide. Many people forget that the world agreed on a global climate change for uh, cl global climate change framework treaty in Rio, which established an interesting process of political commitments, scientific reviews, ongoing updates, all to be pursued with subsequent conferences of the parties. And of course, that's exactly what led to the Paris uh, Accord. And by the way, it's the only global climate change treaty ever ratified by the US Senate. Deng starts to revive reform in China, as Christina mentions. Um, and that sets the course until Xi Jinping's reassertion of the Communist Party and state uh, control starting in 2012 when he's concerned about what he feels is the lost decade. And as Christina mentioned, President Bush uh, loses election in a uh, uh, in an economic recession. From a U.S. perspective, 1992 is also a lost year in history. So I hope Christina might recover it because most writers focus on Bush's role in ending the Cold War in Europe and also the Gulf War to liberate uh, Kuwait through with a grand UN coalition. In fact, I think historians will find that Bush laid most of the foundations for US post-Cold War policy that extended through the Clinton and the Bush 43 administrations. He also, uh, through Baker, led a peace process for the Middle East that continued for decades. There's the climate change treaty I mentioned. There's the Uruguay round, NAFTA, and APEC launched in 1989, which Bill Clinton moves to a summit level in 1993. There's the efforts to support Yeltsin's Russia, which continued through much of the Clinton administration. There's the basis for NATO enlargement. There's an efforts to develop a new US-EU partnership as the European Union grows out of the European uh, community. And there's also changes of CSCE to OSCE to support democratic reform. So all in all, uh, post-wall, post-square is not only a superb contribution to history, 
But it's also a wonderful starting point for starting to think about the European Union and Britain and the US roles in a fast evolving international system today. Um, it also serves one other purpose from the point of a, a diplomatic lesson. Uh, many histories tend to focus on the broad visions that people include in their speeches and they'll include the tactics. What they often overlook is what I think is the most important part, which is the operational art uh, in between. How you try to connect the dots, how you try to take the different factors and weave them together to create additional leverage or a, a dynamism that serves a larger purpose. And if you think about the transnational issues we face today, pandemic and biological security, climate and environmental issues, uh, data and cybersecurity issues, uh, broader economic uh, recovery and growth, those are going to be challenges that one can't just put in individual boxes. It's a question of how we can adapt institutions while paying close attention to some of the traditional security concerns, such as nuclear proliferation or states that want to try to achieve regional he hegemony or ones that now try to uh, rewrite the territorial uh, borders that we thought had been settled after 1989 and 92. So this is a wonderful book. I compliment Christina uh, for it. And I thank you, Anthony, for trying to draw some additional attention for this very significant uh, accomplishment. Thank you very much indeed, Bob. Um, and thank you for sparing the time to be with us. We really, we really appreciate that. Now, uh, we have the opportunity for, for about half an hour, we have the opportunity for questions and answers or comments from the digital floor. Um, received one comment so far, and I think we also have online uh, a former member of the Lithuanian parliament in 1989, Laimi Andrikiena, who was, of course, subsequently a member of the European Parliament, and if so, we would like to go over to you to actually ask a, a question or make a comment in person as somebody like um, Bob, who was present at the creation, as it were, of these dramatic events. And one of the great things about relatively recent history of this kind is that you still have a lot of people around who can remember and in many ways were active agents in the process uh, themselves. So if Laimi is there, please do come on the line. And if not, we'll come back to you when you are able to join us. Um, one question that's come in uh, already is from uh, Andrash, and he asks, um, in the context of what you've been describing, what is your take on the dramatic backsliding in Hungary in recent years? I'd like to focus this discussion, incidentally, less on the current than on the history component, because that's the great, uh, huge advantage of having the uh, two um, guests that we do with us today, but it's a very interesting question. And of course, at the time, there was already speculation that there might be a, a form of new nationalism that would uh, evolve uh, in Central Eastern Europe or indeed in the uh, ex-Soviet Union. And I was struck by this in something I was reading recently, not, in, not actually in this book, a quote from Isaiah Berlin in an interview which he gave to the um, uh, New York Review of Books in 1991. And he, he said, um, after years of oppression and humiliation, there is liable to occur a violent counter-reaction, an outburst of national pride, often aggressive self-assertion self by liberated nations and their leaders. So trying to look at subsequent events in Central Eastern Europe in that historical optic, how do you read the way things played out? First of all, over to you, Christina. Yeah, I think that this is an interesting question to look at because, I mean, first of all, if you go back, we have to think of, okay, so Soviet communism had failed and the Soviet empire by imposition, by which I mean the, you know, the Red Army that would have to withdraw, um, that was being discarded. Um, but you see now, how it's seen now, it's almost like, you know, what came afterwards, if there had been previously, you know, the Soviet ideology, then now it's almost like, oh, that god of liberalism is failing, and that is the complete disaster. But let that, let's remind ourselves where we were. I mean, first of all, of course, in the Soviet um, satellite states, in the Eastern European countries, um, the, those people who were not excited by communism also not just rejected communism for communism's sake, but because it was Soviet imposed. There was also strong anti-Muscovite sentiments, and of course, in particular, in the countries that had 
um, suffered repression, such as in Hungary in 1956, but also in Czechoslovakia, in Poland, and also how the Baltic republics inside the Soviet Union uh, felt towards uh, what was coming from the Kremlin. So the moment they have, from the moment when Gorbachev takes the fear of the tank away, and you see, uh, you know, this one or two years of um, revolutionary change moving into electoral revolution, by which I mean, you know, we see then the changes of the regimes. In the Hungarian case, we saw, of course, also the communists splitting into reform communists and and the more old-fashioned communists and new parties emerging. We see the emergence of pluralism. Uh, and this desire to consolidate democracy and to push forwards out of these goulash economy, economies into um, you know, the, free, the free market economy and then seeking integration uh, in the free trade areas and, in there, and thereby in the first instance seeking association agreements uh, with the European community, then European Union. So it's all about adopting the market and also trying to um, develop a model of democracy and trying to make that viable and sustainable all the while also, of course, given that, you know, nobody had a, had a real uh, plan. How do you really move out of the command economic model uh, into, into capitalism? I mean, we, capitalism as such wasn't new, of course, you know, in the time before Soviet communism, there had been free market. So um, it, it's not like, you know, suddenly this is something completely new as in it hasn't been experienced before if we think about the 1920s, for example. Yeah, but the point is that this desire to seek that prosperity and that sort of, in, you know, if you, if you want to use the German word, den Anschluss, but not in the sense of, you know, 1938, but, you know, to connect up with those Western European institutions, with the Western European community to reunify that Europe, that to use that term uh, Gensha used, you know, there was this knocking on those institutions. And there was, of course, because the European community was deepening into the EU, that the standards were higher that had to be achieved. You know, these acquis communautaires, uh, as of course your MEPs will know much more details about than even I would do. But the point is that it was about adopting the market and then thinking about what kind of Western democratic model to use. Because, for example, British parliamentary democracy and American democracy and German uh, parliamentary democracy, they are all somewhat different models. And you have to find one that suits you and make it work. How it has changed afterwards is because it has been sensed that somehow by then, you know, that 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 rise of nationalism that you have that carried in some ways also the protesters out of that shadow uh, of this of the Soviet Union, if you so want, and then joining that European club one generation further along, of course, as part of privatization and of this huge transformation, we see um, socioeconomic cleavages in society. It becomes perceived as something quite negative, and it also becomes perceived that the culprit is this, you know, what seems to many a sort of abstract institution as of the EU, made worse perhaps even by, um, you know, further uh, economic problems through the euro and then the 2008 economic crisis, and that negativity gets turned into, oh, the EU as a post-national project is our problem, and then it's sort of a reverting inverts into this kind of nationalist sentiment. And then the narrative gets transformed and that rather than reuniting with Europe and being part of this united Europe, um, it was actually that one had just been imitating and copying something. One never found something of oneself. It becomes translated into a sort of negative uh, narrative, into this narrative of that somehow the West imposed this uh, on the Eastern Europeans. And completely forgetting that the whole point had been the agency of this small and medium-sized Central European states, precisely because they did not want to be dominated by any big power. And that agency is almost given away by converting the narrative into something that it was transposed and imposed by some, uh, you know, uh, Western uh, construct, which of course is also a narrative, in, uh, incidentally, fed by the Putin regime uh, via social media and, 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 and stoking this populism. So, you know, a positive narrative through a negative experience is then completely then turned on its head and turned into something negative then via this sort of nationalist impulse driven sentiment. So, Anthony, could I add something to this? Please, please do. So, um, when I was in college, I recalled reading uh, a book called The Lands Between. I think it was by a British author named Ellen Palmer. <clears throat> 
And it made a very significant impression on me because one had a sense of the historical tensions within the Central and Eastern European countries torn between Germany in the West and, and uh, Russia and, and the Soviet Union and the complex political dynamics that it would create. So part of the thinking in 1989 and 90 was how to create a framework for their evolution. And Christina touches on this in the book. Again, it's a piece uh, of history often overlooked. As early as the July 1989 summit, Economic Summit in Paris, um, Bush has just come from visiting Poland and Hungary. Um, the summit was designed by Mitterrand to focus on the developing world. And Bush argues to Mitterrand, we need to focus on Central and Eastern Europe. And from the start, the US view was we need to make sure that Western Europe pays attention to Eastern Europe, because at that point, Western Europe was focused on the deepening uh, integration idea. And uh, we actually encouraged the creation of something called the G24, steered by the European Commission to try to support aid. Um, and it was part of an early effort of the United States to encourage the concept of enlargement of the European Union, which was clearly a magnet uh, or of the, of the EC, a magnet to the Eastern Europeans. This is, it's interesting because at the time there were critics uh, of Bush saying, look, you know, he's deferring to Europe. In my view, it was good strategy if we could get Europe to take responsibility for Eastern Europe um, and frankly, save us some of the money. Um, but this logic continues because the United States is a supporter early on of both NATO enlargement and while dealing respectfully with European enlargement because you needed to create a framework. And I would argue that for all the tensions that one sees in Hungary and to a degree Poland and some of the Balkan countries today, imagine what would be going on in the politics if they felt insecure uh, and caught between sort of Russia and, uh, and Germany and Western Europe. The internal divisions played by the nationalist and populist politics would be so much worse. Um, so I think that, again, the strategic architecture of uh, creating, as Bush called, a Europe whole and free through the EU and NATO is fundamental. Now, what it poses, the challenge, is that the work that one generation does never uh, sort of leaves the next generation without anything to do. And so this poses a real question for the European Union about how, having brought these countries in, it will try to use a combination of incentives and disincentives to make sure that you have a democratic European Union. Um, and I'll give you a specific example of this, uh, again, showing this question of the operational art and connecting the dots. Um, when I was at the World Bank, having had experience with Eastern Europe, I was wanted to help Bulgaria and to a degree Romania. Um, and we found that uh, the, uh, a lot of the funds that have been committed by the European Commission were not even really being used, <laughs> much less being used properly um, by some of the Eastern European states. And so we tried to direct our assistance programs towards the institutional changes that would allow these countries to use the European funds uh, more effectively. And what I think it showed was that the, the nature of the European Union's legal system kind of says you're in, and then you are supposed to abide by this huge body of law, but it needed more attention on the ongoing transition, even after you were in, not just before you were in. And so these are the types of questions of both structure and, and politics and policy that the European Union will face today. I would just say it would be a lot worse if those countries weren't in the European Union and NATO. Thank you very much indeed, Bob. Thank you very much, Christina, for that. Uh, we're still uh, open for questions. So if you've got any questions or comments that you'd like to pose, please uh, put them now in either the Q&A section or in the chat section. Um, whilst I'm waiting for such a question, I want to ask if I may, Bob, a specific question which relates to American foreign policy at that time. Uh, everybody knows that from the Second World War onwards, the United States played a very important role in trying to promote European unity. But there was a kind of ambivalence in that. Henry Kissinger famously remarked, I think, just before he became um, Nixon's um, national security advisor, he said that uh, Washington has consistently urged European Union whilst recoiling before its probable consequences. 
which I think is a lovely phrase. So I want to ask you about what was going through the mind of the Bush administration in that period, starting in January 1989, when he took office. And how far was there a, con a conscious reset in policy in favour of closer European integration, separate to, I mean, logically separate to, the events that were then about to unfold so spectacularly? Yeah, that's a very important question. Um, President Bush was concerned about uh, the EC92 integration process because recall, the United States was at loggerheads with Europe in negotiating the Uruguay round, and the fear was that EC92 would lead to a protectionist bloc. Um, and remember, 92 was Bush's year of re-election. He didn't want to necessarily have a protectionist Europe in, uh, one, uh, at the moment of re-election. Um, Baker uh, started out being a little skeptical, because remember, he came from the Treasury Department, and in the uh, late 80s, the European finance ministries hadn't bought in totally to the European integration project. In fact, in their side comments, they were often somewhat sort of skeptical. Um, but frankly, uh, I, I was able to meet uh, my friend for, for decades now, Pascal Lamy, who was the chef de cabinet for, for uh, Jacques Delors. And uh, my judgment was that the integration process could be combined with a broader liberalization process that would open markets. And so uh, it was in the United States' interest to try to engage that process. And uh, even today, people say, well, should you work with the member states of Europe or should you work with the institutions of Europe? My rather pragmatic judgment was we should work with both. <laughs> and, and so you'll see, again, it's more of a footnote to history. At the same time, we were dealing with NATO's uh, in uh, Germany, yet a Germany and NATO in Eastern Europe, there was an effort to try to build closer institutional ties with an integrating Europe. Uh, Mitterrand was somewhat resistant of this because he was fearful that it would lead to sort of too much US influence. Um, but I think again, over time, one sort of recognizes, given the larger world that Christina sketches in her book, uh, having some degree of cooperation through multiple institutional structures, networks, if you will, between the United States and Europe will be vital. And I would add, Anthony, from your side, you know, one of the, the parts that is a little unfortunate is, as people discuss the new world orders of today, we also need to make sure that Britain has a place in it. Indeed, of course, in this role, I'm here entirely as a European. Uh, Christina? Yeah, I think, um, you know, in the topics that have been discussed now in the last two rounds, there is, of course, this question, you know, like, was the, were the Americans looking to Europe as the EU? And of course, there were discussions, for example, between uh, the Bush administration and Jacques Delors. And on the other hand, there was, of course, also, um, you know, bilateral engagement. So, you know, the, the Americans were desperate to get the French to come up, um, you know, with good behavior over uh, this whole agricultural policy. And of course, I would also talk to the Germans because the Germans were talking to the French in terms of pushing forward that European project. And when we talked about this development um, of, of Europe, of course, there was this thing that for the, for the French, the, the European economic deepening was important. Where Helmut Kohl was much more interested in particular on these questions of democracy deficit, getting the European Parliament stronger and the political side. But why am I mentioning this? I'm also mentioning this in view of, you know, then the aid given um, either via the G24 or through the EU to Eastern Europe. And of course, and how does that look when you look at it bilaterally from the perspective of those lands in between that zwischen Europa? Because although um, Germany was the strongest economic force in Europe and number three in the world, um, in spite of all these costs of unification, you know, the economy was doing very well. And um, there was a sense also, and that's, that's where the rivalry even between EU members comes in. For example, from France's perspective, if the Germans get too much lever and too much a first foot into the, the um, uh, newly uh, free market economies of Eastern Europe, then Germany becomes sort of that economic powerhouse with, you know, too much influence in that part of the world. Whereas ideationally, of course, Helmut Kohl had said already in his 10 point plan, which related really to German unification and anchoring Europe, that the EU should not stop at the Elbe. 
that you know that it wouldn't just be all about the CSCE but about the EU while fully aware when you look at the conversations with François Mitterrand that it would take time because in fact there were other neutral states neutral non-aligned states that was Austria Sweden and Finland who already economically fulfilled the bill uh, of joining um, but of course for various cold war reasons had not joined the EC before. So, you know, there, there was always a political side and economic side. But if you think about the bigger powers in terms of political power in the union, then it's always from the German perspective, a problem how it looks. It's one question of what you can do, what you maybe should do, but also then how that is perceived. So on the one hand, there was pressure that Germany should take more responsibility, that it should use its Deutschmark power um, to really support in the stabilization process, but in some ways the German government was keen to do. And of course, you see what Helmut Kohl does during the 1990s. But on the other hand, it's always we do too much then that's also seen as something negative, as comes out also in this context of Yugoslavia, if Germany does something on its own. So the problem, um, even when you look at a, a club that's turning from community to union, in, in that sense becomes politically more integrated. And for all the American worries about a fortress of Europe, there's always also that intergovernmental level, uh, other than the supranational level, uh, that plays into the way these negotiations are conducted. And you could see that, for example, in the G7 uh, discussions, uh, when it's you know, not just that you have a European community representative in Jacques Delors uh, perhaps taking part, but also how the negotiations happen with very particular leaders. Thank you for that. Uh, sorry. Um, we've now got questions coming in uh, from several quarters, but I just would like to follow up, if I may, using my position as chair, just for a moment, uh, to ask Bob a follow-up question on the NATO aspect, which is you mentioned the questions of NATO's role and indeed NATO's expansion. Uh, what is the truth or otherwise of the assertion, which is widespread, that uh, Gorbachev uh, took the view and that he had been given assurances, and I'm quoting from an interview he gave in April 2009, quote, that NATO would not move a centimetre to the east after the end of the Cold War. Was that how it seemed at the time? And is that really what occurred? So, um, yeah, thank you for asking this one because obviously it's a, it's a subject that's been much debated. Um, first, uh, both Shevardnadze before he passed away and Kozarev, his successor as Russia's foreign minister, um, both made very clear that there was never a commitment not to extend NATO to Eastern Europe. Um, and in some ways, I find the assertion a bit ironic in that anyone who negotiated with the Soviets or, for that matter, the Russians today uh, would find it hard to believe that they wouldn't uh, insist that some commitment be part of the written process. Uh, can you imagine a Russian diplomat saying, oh, yeah, well, we had a passing conversation on that subject. We don't need to write it down in any of the two plus four or final settlement treaties or any other commitments. Uh, that's quite uh, unbelievable. Uh, third, what people always forget here is that the ultimate decision that Gorbachev made coming out of the June 1990 summit with Bush about accepting a united Germany uh, within NATO was based on the logic that CSCE principles um, permitted countries to choose their own alliances. And, and frankly, this was something that I came up with and got put into uh, Bush's talking points because I knew that Gorbachev was very committed to those principles. And other people have relayed the story how Bush raised this point. Uh, everyone was surprised when Gorbachev <laughs> accepted it. His own colleagues uh, seemed to be uh, pulled away from him. Uh, we asked Bush to repeat it and Gorbachev accepted it again. It was in the uh, sort of the departure statement. But that principle would certainly suggest that others would be free to join their own alliance. Um, fourth, uh, years later, when I spoke with Wolfgang Ischner, because I was out of government in the 90s, and NATO started to discuss the partnerships uh, with Eastern Europe and with Russia, um, Wolfgang told me that the Russian diplomats made no uh, assertion that there had been a commitment to not to enlarge to Eastern Europe. So that was the Russian view uh, in the 90s. So the, the logical question is, what happened? And this is very important, I think, in understanding diplomacy in general and certainly diplomacy in that period. Um, 
remember, all this occurs within 11 months. Think, imagine today what you would want to try to get done in 11 months. Um, it's moving at a very fast pace. People are trying out ideas. And it is clear that when Baker was speaking uh, to the Soviets about Germany and NATO, he poses this idea about, in the case of East Germany, that uh, Germany would be within NATO, uh, but that U.S. forces wouldn't move one inch to the east. And he uses the word jurisdiction, which created some of the future problems. Within a day or two, he clarifies that. And it, it's an example of the fact that um, people are trying to come up with ideas to solve problems. His main point, which was the point that ultimately uh, the Soviets accepted, was that for European stability, it would be better to have Germany uh, within NATO. The Russians or Soviets sort of accepted this point. Um, frankly, there was absolutely no discussion of Central and Eastern Europe. So it was simply a question of what you would do with the former GDR. And the two plus four agreement does have specific provisions about uh, the withdrawal of, of Soviet forces. And it even came down to the last night, a question about what would be the role of non-German NATO forces um, in the, the Eastern lender. Um, you'll actually discover that the NATO documents trying to reach out to uh, the Soviets at the time of the 1990 NATO summit talk about setting up NATO liaison offices. And I think Christina mentioned this. And this later becomes uh, an idea that I developed with my German colleagues about um, a, um, uh, uh, um, a, a, a NAC, uh, which was, an, uh, again, the North Atlantic Cooperation Council to reach out. This later becomes evolved into the sort of the partnership uh, for peace. These are all examples of recognizing that while dealing with the challenges of the moment, you are trying to prepare plant seeds for, for future relationships. And I have a very clear recollection because uh, on the last night in Moscow, when this issue arose about what would be the status, the ability of non-German NATO forces in the Eastern lender. My poor British colleagues took a lot of flack for sort of uh, harping on the issue um, and the Germans took it out on them. But frankly, I, I was also concerned about the topic, but they couldn't criticize me because I'd been their strongest supporter. And, and here's was my concern. I was thought at some point, Poland may want to join NATO and that if it did, you'd want to have the ability to have non-German NATO forces cross the Eastern lender to be able to go to Poland. Now, I wasn't going to be shouting that at the table, but it was certainly uh, in my mind in, in late uh, September 1990. So that's uh, an example of kind of both how the diplomacy happened, what was committed, what the record was. What people need to be aware of is if you look at uh, President Putin's approach. Will he use this as a example to try to say Russia was mistreated? Of course he will. I mean, <laughs> please recognize what you're dealing with in terms of President Putin. If it's not clear to Europeans by now, I don't know what else would can, sort of can clarify. It's a separate decision of whether, Germ whether NATO should have enlarged. That's a separate set of issue. My own personal belief was it was a good step for the reason that we just explained with the prior exchange. I don't think it would be healthy if Eastern European countries were sort of left in the lands between. On the other hand, I also think that NATO should not extend its security guarantee if it doesn't mean it. So therefore, I was not a believer that it should be extended to Ukraine or Georgia. Thank you for that. Christina? Yeah, if I can um, compliment that, you know, because obviously as a historian, I've also looked at the historical record and looked at all those protocols that exist for the meetings. And the whole point is that, you know, yes, there is this sentence about the not one inch further east, but it's always taken out of context. When you actually read that passage, you discover that there are several sentences afterwards and the conversation between Baker and Gorbachev continues and you realize that it's all about this question of this, what is jurisdiction, what is about foreign troops and nuclear weapons and that kind of stationing uh, into the East German territory. There's no special delimitation or exclusion of what may be with Poland or Hungary and so forth. Where this may have become a bit conflated is because since Genscher was a little bit more cautious, although he used the very same language as Baker, and you must look at them as two foreign secretaries who have a legal background, the way they use words is probably not always the most convenient and can be often, you know, read in different kinds of ways. It's because Genscher was worried that, you know, if one 
um, left it open, then maybe um, something that should be left to the future should be contemplated beforehand. And Genscher, for example, talked with Douglas Hurd um, about this question of NATO and if one makes too much noise and the Poles and the Hungarians get too excited and want to jo join straight away, then you have to actually deal with that also in the public domain. And he alluded to that, uh, to Shevard Nazi, but at no point did even Genscher say anything about the delimitation. And what was so interesting is how so quickly, because Kohl was meeting Gorbachev the day after Baker met Gorbachev, and the whole point was that thinking moved on very rapidly, and the idea was to then use not that word jurisdiction, but special status. And why is this relevant more widely? Because not only has East German terrain to this day a special status within that um, Eastern European context, but also because to this day there are no permanent bases by, um, you know, and permanently based troops um, by the Western Alliance in those Eastern European states. And that is all part of this compromise. And you have to simply uh, relate to the fact that everything we can see on paper, everything that was negotiated, came out of a compromise where both sides tried to find a mutually acceptable solution. And why was after the Caucasus summit of uh, July 1990, when the Germans and the Soviets negotiated elements uh, of this NATO deal, which is namely that the Germans would pay for the Red Army troop withdrawal, for the building of barracks in, in the Soviet Union, that these troops could go and live somewhere. Why did this whole package in the end cost 100, million, 100 billion uh, Deutschmarks? Uh, it has all got to do um, with the headline that in the end it was the Second World War is over. It is really about also German-Soviet reconciliation. Now, how did it look from Putin's perspective? He was a KGB officer in the GDR who, far away from his home country, far away from feeling anything about the reforms, probably just felt all he's seeing is that the country he's representing uh, is sort of um, going under. And in the end, or even has to deal with its complete disintegration. So, you know, you have to understand where this reinterpretation of history comes from, where this false memory syndrome comes from, and how it's been tried and tried over again by taking sentences out of the context and then giving them a new spin. And it is really surprising to me how, you know, when we can all go, these things are in the public domain, read these documents, that over and over again, um, the same false memories are being peddled by just picking out certain sentences completely out of context and out of context of the realities that have actually emerged. And one of the big things was precisely this freedom of choice, also under the Helsinki Final Act, that included the Eastern Europeans who had just undergone electoral revolutions to choose which alliances they would like to join, just like the Germans choosing which alliance they would like to join. And then it was for the alliance to decide well, what do we do with people who want to join? And why would we deny to some and not to others? And that's why it, of course, becomes a question, what is defensible terrain? Because you have this Article 5 and 6 question in the NATO, as Bob already highlighted. You have to think, if you let somebody in the club, then do these articles actually stick? Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, do come back. A question on uh, that someone asked what Christina meant by the special status of the Eastern uh, uh, the GDR. What what this was trying to recognize was that during a transition period, uh, you had to get the 380,000 Soviet forces home, um, and there were restrictions on what would be done with non-German NATO forces uh, in the Eastern Lender. But uh, it it didn't mean that there would be a restriction on Germany's sovereignty and independence as a state. And in fact, when there was this disagreement in Moscow on the last night about the question I raised, whether uh, non-German NATO forces, to what degree could they go into the Eastern Lender, the ultimate resolution was with a note that said, Germany as an independent sovereign country will make this decision taking into consideration all these other issues. The reason I highlight this is that again, um, at the time, it seemed like a, perhaps a theoretical point, but over, over time, I think it's important. The U.S. view was it was very important not to singularize Germany, was the term we used. We didn't want to plant the seeds for a future German generation, maybe two or three or four generations on, to say, why are we being singled out? Uh, we thought that was one of the dangers coming out of the Versailles experience. So it's, a, it's another little interesting tidbit about how you can draw from history and making policy. 
Thank you for that. And that, that was responding to a question which had been posed by Gonzalo de Mendoza. And I'd now like to go to a question from Pavel Chernok. And he says, I'd like to ask about the role of new leaders, those who emerged in the early 1990s as partners, and especially the US support for a new generation of future leaders from Central and Eastern Europe through various programs. So, um, Christina, what have you discovered about the potential influence or the actual influence that those uh, individuals had with conscious support from the United States or other Western capitals? Well, I think you see this a whole bunch of um, new leaders that they, they sought education uh, from, from Western countries. I mean, you have to think that not only was the political system uh, in this array, also the whole um, education system, um, you know, underwent change, especially when you come to look at you know, subjects like political science or history or economics. So it's quite natural that uh, many of the young people in the 1990s um, sought to get their education abroad. But, you know, I mean, as you know, American British universities, that is an expensive undertaking. Um, so it was only too obvious that as part of the um, Western assistance packages that were actively sought. I mean, you, ha you have to really look at some of those protocols. You know, what did Lech Walesa, Mazowiecki, um, you know, the Hungarians, what, Havel, what were they looking for? They were, they were looking um, for money to fund, um, you know, the changes, uh, and not just, you know, um, in terms of uh, food aid and so forth um, to help inside the states and education and political education, historical education um, was a very important um, aspect of this, including, you know, simply getting access to to Western literature. I'll just add that uh, the, the United States throughout the Cold War had a deep sympathy with people in Eastern Europe yearning to be free. And so uh, sometimes this gets the United States into trouble, but at that era, uh, it was uh, a very strong response. You'd had very large, you had large Eastern European and, and Baltic uh, communities in the United States. And so um, this goes somewhat to my point about encouraging that they be enveloped within the European Union and sort of not being left uh, outside. But I'll extend it to my own experience with an interesting example. So one of the people whose careers I wanted to help advance at the World Bank was a woman named Kristalina Georgieva, uh, who comes from Bulgaria, um, took part in some of the programs in London. Uh, I advanced her position. She became a star in the European Commission. She comes back to the World Bank, and now she's the head of the IMF. So this is a wonderful success story from that era. Thank you very much uh, for that. I'm going to take another question that's come in. If you, if, if, if you uh, have got the time to just allow us to um, overrun for a few minutes. Um, and this comes from uh, Alzra uh, Alali Onate. Um, how would you explain the difficulties in developing civil society in Russia and in some parts of Eastern Europe, despite long lasting efforts of West Europeans? So the problem with a development of a civil society. In a way, it goes back to a little bit the issue we were talking about in the context of that Azar Berlin quote. Uh, Christina. Well, I mean, I mentioned that point about education, but um, the other thing is also, of course, you know, how you have to, there are several things that need to happen. And, you know, I, I've, as, as a Finn, I have looked a little bit at Estonia, but of course I have also first ex experience uh, since I'm half German, half Finnish, also from the from the German side. I mean, there's there's always a bit of a problem with that language of civil society because you could take the view that you know the dissidents, the protesters, in some ways they were emerging as a civil society. But what you also need is simply you know uh, political education. So, for example, although in Germany uh, it was done very successfully of you know creating the state structures. Um, you know, of, of running that entire absorption and at all levels into the West German state structure that had been perceived, you know, as a as a success in that post World War II world. Um, if you look at simply, you know, um, expl explaining the constitution, explaining the electoral system in schools, there was a complete failure uh, on that on that front uh, in Eastern Germany of discussing the past of you know how to deal with the East German past, the socialist past, and also dealing with the Nazi past. So if you look at, for example, what had happened with mastering the past uh, in terms of Nazi past in West Germany under, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the occupation and then later allied reserved rights in the various zones in, in, in West Germany, of course, in East Germany, none of that had been really sort of mastered, if you so want. 
But in the 1990s and 2000s, there has been a failure of really thinking and addressing how to how to deal with these different experiences and how to you know set them into context and how to deal with that baggage, if you so want, also in in relation to what kind of system you're living in now. So let me take, for example, um, now Estonia. Uh, where you have to, you know, look at what happened with a country that had become independent in the aftermath um, of um, World War I. Uh, and then, you know, if you make comparisons, for example, this Finland, why did the Baltic Republics end up under the Hitler-Stalin pact uh, in, in the Soviet sphere? And how do you deal with these different layers of occupation and, and these questions of, you know, who was collaborating with the Soviets and who was collaborating with the Nazis? And why had the government before sort of turned increasingly further to the right before it even got to the World War II? And how did people manage under the occupation? You know, after all, we have to remember there was a de facto non-recognition of the Baltics annexation into the Soviet Union. Then you could watch some Finnish TV, so you had some information what was happening outside. You had also uh, people in exile. You had uh, certain people had uh, access to Western materials. But you have all these different levels of how people have coped with these different regimes and in these different periods, even within families. And um, you know, even if you think about the literature that's up, that has come out since, you know, Sophie Oxanen's novels that highlight, you know, the pain and the, the, you know, trying to forget and try to remember and trying to, um, you know, create a prosperity and stability and a functioning system. These are, you know, very uh, complicated stories, which in each country also given their histories are completely different. And um, in some ways, you know, I think, you know, education and a pragmatic way of discuss discussion is very important. The trouble is that very often, you know, uh, when populists get involved and emotions get stirred, this can get sort of out of control. But I think uh, a sort of really good understanding um, of what really happened historically is absolutely crucial. And that's why what I highlighted before this, you know, the, 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 um, the glut of falsified uh, facts uh, floating around and, and, and driving people's minds it's a very bad thing. We need to be in complete agreement, at least on certain things that we just know did historically happen the way they happened. And then we have to think about how we deal with them emotionally and how we structure our lives according to the way we want to live and according to which principles. Thank you. Do you have a moment, you have a moment for me to add something? Yes, please. And then I'm going to squeeze in one last question off okay. that. Okay. Um, so I want to build off this point uh, that Christina mentioned, which of course each country is is unique. And uh, I'll share a historical experience. I remember visiting Romania with Baker, I think it was in January of 1990. And we we're trying to see the transitional government, but also we we're meeting civil society groups. And I was struck more than in any other country in Eastern Europe, how Ceausescu had atomized the society. In other words, people didn't trust their own family members, much less anybody in the community, because that was part of his, his style about seizing control. And I think what we're even seeing today in a broader way in the United States and Europe is trust is one of these fundamental elements for both civil society and sort of democratic governance. So you could see that Romania was gonna have a particularly challenging path. In the case of Poland, the solidarity movement was an incredible, incredible cohesive device. And I think Balsarovich led an extremely important uh, economic restructuring effort. It was very difficult. I remember visiting again in 91 and 92, and you could see that even among the opposition at that time, because of the solidarity background, they were still willing to work together very difficult circumstances. You also have a country that has very strong Catholic traditions, which has always been part of Polish nationalism, but you see how those are sort of playing out today in different forms. In, in the Balts, uh, as Christina mentioned, uh, I had an opportunity to visit some of their historical museums, which are a wonderful way of getting a sense of how countries sort of see their, their past. The, I remember the Museum of Resistance and others. And I personally think this very strong sense of trying to preserve independence within the Baltic countries is what led them to take very courageous economic steps after 2008, 2009. What all this comes down to is ultimately institutions. And I think one of the challenges that uh, people are more sensitive to after this experience is the dangers of corruption uh, in institutions. Um, a number of the, in a, the sort of former communist parties or people who had been in control, uh, or frankly, the organized crime networks that had been underneath the surface, uh, 
they seized control of these institutions. You see this in, as a very big problem all around the world. And I think this continues to be a challenge for some of the Eastern European countries because it breeds public distrust. And I think this is part of the Hungary story. I mean, if I, from a distance, as I look at the turn in the elections, when people lost trust and feeling that the elected leaders were corrupt, then they're willing to turn to somebody who's going to, quote, clean it up. And this is a populist story. Um, I think the challenge for the European Union is people are aware of this issue, but how do they try to deal with it without looking heavy handed and like they're running something from Brussels? Um, and, and I think that's a, a very serious challenge. So I think this is where, again, I've always complimented the German Stiftung. And frankly, I think more of these within the European context to sort of reach out to younger generations, get them out of the country to see other places. The mobility within Europe, I think, is going to be very important. Your university programs. Um, the danger with this is that sometimes people then leave and then don't come back. But with the right policies back at the national level, I think uh, this, this will change again, even as it will in sort of the eastern parts of Germany. Well, thank you for that. In fact, you've kind of partly answered the last question which I was going to pose, which was from Andrew Bolton, who was talking about the triumph of the oligarchs in Russia and the extent to which Western decision makers and leaders in the 1990s can share some of the responsibility, if you like, for the brutality of the economic transition that occurred and some of the problems that followed from that. Uh, and I think that transition was particularly brutal in Russia. So I'm going to, if I may, uh, just ask one very final question and come back to something which Christina said in her opening remarks. You talked about the fact that um, the revolutions of 1989, 1990, 1991 were um, unusual in that there was no real mass violence. There was perhaps a, a significant violent dimension uh, in Romania and in some other instances. But as Philip Thayer, in this really excellent book, which I also recommend to anybody who's interested in this period, uh, Europe since 1989 has written. He said, uh, the essential difference between 1989 uh, and 1789, 1848 and 1917 was its predominant lack of violence and willful destruction with no mass terror, making the events of 1989 more like those of 1776 in the US than previous European revolutions. Now, some people have also said that the flip side of that is that nothing particularly innovative or historically really significant other than the change in the uh, governance, if you like, of the countries themselves came out of it. The French historian Francois Furet, um, historian of the French Revolution, remarked perhaps rather harshly that not a single new idea has come out of Eastern Europe in 1989, while Habermas styled the events of that time, in his words, as a catch-up or rectifying series of revolutions. Christine, Christina, how do you see that in historical perspective? I think what you see here is when people concentrate primarily on that revolutionary aspect and think about, you know, what comes out of into ideational ways out of revolutions. I thought it was interesting you mentioned the book by Thea because the dates you mentioned all relate to revolutions. But what I tried to highlight in the beginning is that although the revolutionary element is really crucial in 1989, why the hinge years moving out of one era into another in world historical terms is really crucial is because we have a complete topographical transformation. We haven't just national and transnational revolutions. We have actually a redrawing of the map. You have to just think about the collapse of two states, the collapse of the Soviet Union and of Yugoslavia. This, you know, even Soviet Union as a Eurasian empire, if you so want, affects the boundaries that we are dealing with in Europe. This is not just about national revolutions and domestic processes and the questions whether new ideas in terms of uh, what is coming out in, in, in terms of national governance or, or national identity questions is coming out. This is really about, um, you know, how both the continent, but as I tried to highlight, how also the world order changed. And that is where we really have to, you know, and I highlight this again, we need to open our eyes beyond looking at this period just as a revolution and something that occurred in Europe. We need to look at, you know, a, a, a transformative uh, period, short period, where we exit one era and move into a new era, a new era that we are still trying to really understand. Look, we don't even have a name yet, what we would call the last 30 years, even if we talk about 
today that we are somehow dealing with some kind of change, whatever that may be, even if we're moving, you know, from a Trump presidency to a Biden presidency, there has been a sort of sense that something in the last couple of years has shifted, as you know, the Russians have talked about that we're moving into a post West world, um, you know, trying to challenge America's uh, unipolar position, trying to talk about polycentrism as the Chinese do, you know, this sort of new alignment of um, world political power, a new correlation of forces that also the Euro-Atlantic community has to look at up front. I mean, how does the Euro-Atlantic community position itself vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, the Chinese Silk Road project? And why am I raising this again at a world political level? Because also when we look at 1989 to 1992, we need to look at this as a transformative period in world politics, not just as a moment of revolutionary upheaval. It's much bigger than that. It had to do with world order, with redrawing the map. And uh, then we can ask ourselves, you know, OK, did, we, did, did our ideas of how the new world order would be managed, was that too dumb? Was that coming out of a linear narrative after 45 that we wanted a rules based world that we wanted to act according to principles that we wanted organizations to help us to help statesmen uh, you know uh, direct a, a peaceful world order well that clearly has failed we have had wars at, in all kinds uh, of ways we have had a financial crash we need other forms of somehow managing also what we perceive now and can see and must see in open eyes that there is again a shift in the correlation uh, of power. And now we will see also how uh, America, uh, with a president that I'm sure is going to be acting uh, more multilaterally than the recent one, uh, how that is going to pan out in terms of that Euro-Atlantic community. What is happening with America as a European power, as it had affirmed itself in this transformative period of 89 to 92? It just wasn't a blip of the Cold War period. It was something that lived on and helped with the stability and peaceful transition. Thank you. Bob, any final thoughts? Sure. Um, so one, uh, revolutions don't have to be bloody to be important. Um, so the question coming from uh, a French intellectual, I guess I might turn it back and say, how did that revolution work out? Uh, it looked to me like it had a few twists and turns before we created the Fifth Republic. Um, and similarly, as Christina mentioned, uh, Yugoslavia had plenty of ideas. Uh, they did turn out to be not so good ideas <laughs> in the debate. And to be, be uh, fair about this, even the US case, I think most historians looking back at our revolution would say that it was much more bloody and less united uh, than our national myths would like it to make out to be. Um, then in the area of ideas, this is, this is a wonderful one, particularly for the European Parliament. Um, I think the ideas of democracies, or I would prefer republics because it emphasizes the need to have representative government, um, are really important. And, and, and to try to make them work uh, is, and the institutions is quite uh, significant. So intellectuals may be bored by that work, um, but I tell you there's plenty of room for ideas as we're discovering about um, how to make it work, whether in Europe or the United States or elsewhere. And, and if, if that isn't enough for you, I'll take Christina's point, which I don't want to lose sight of, which is fundamentally what her book also points out, is that we tend to refer to 1989 as the end of the Cold War. True in Europe, not in Asia. <laughs> and if you, if you want to have a question about intellectual debate, we now have authoritarian market-oriented societies, or North Korea being sort of an authoritarian kingdom. And the question is, uh, what will be the future of free societies? Um, when we created our constitution, Ben Franklin was asked what was done, and he said, a republic if you can keep it. And I think that's a challenge all of us have to be aware of. The, the bring it back to Russia, though, where the question focused on. I think, you know, what this underscores for everybody is in the midst of these transformations, the, the, the critical role of, of institutions, rules, market economy, um, these didn't have any precedent in Russia. I mean, you, you had an early, slightly before the czarist uh, overthrow, you had some efforts by um, Count Vita and, and, uh, uh, and others to try to create reform, but you didn't really have that within the society. And I think uh, it is worthwhile to look at the reformers in Russia were so eager to create a private sector 
that they dumped all these assets to oligarchs and doing that without legal uh, structures uh, undoubtedly created problems for the future. I understand what they were doing, but there's a lesson to be learned here if you do it, kind of what problems you're, you're gonna be planning. You can have monopolies of the government or you can have monopolies of, of private sector. Um, ultimately, I think Russia's decisions determine Russia's future. Um, I think this, again, there's a bit of a hubris here of all our sons where we're going to be able to control other countries' destiny. I don't think you can do so. But I do think it's good policy to try to create a more constructive framework. And in that sense, looking not only to China, but the future of Russia, you know, what is interesting is at the macroeconomic level, you've got some very actually uh, impressive technocrats uh, in Russia. Um, I don't think Putin is going to change. I think uh, his posture is one where he's going to try to sort of be a spoiler in terms of uh, what he believes is a new multipolar diplomacy. But for goodness sakes, we need to keep ties open with Russians. I mean, the one benefit compared to the Soviet era is, you know, it's still easier for Russians to have contacts with people outside. And this will be an important challenge, particularly for Europe. Is, is that on the one hand to deal with the threatening behavior, whether cyber or sort of territorial changes, while also keeping doors open to social change. So in a way, it brings us back to the start of Christina's book here, is that you know the events of 1989 came out of 40 years of trying to deter a threat, but also create possibilities when change erupted to take advantage of it. And that would be a smart statesmanship for today. Thank you very much to both of you. We've been going almost 100 minutes. Uh, we peaked at just under 100 people online. We're now still 50. Um, thank you for staying the course, everybody. A particular big thank you, of course, to our two speakers whose time and whose insights we hugely appreciate. Unfortunately, we can't have a kind of physical round of applause, but I hear a big virtual round of applause in appreciation. And before we close, I'd just like to say that uh, Bob has very kindly agreed that he will talk about his own book, which came out recently, America in the World, A History of US Diplomacy and Foreign Policy. And so uh, early next year, we'll be having a book talk with Bob Zellick. And to Christina, thank you so much, first of all, for writing the book, and thank you for sharing your thoughts about this, especially on a special day like today, namely the 31st anniversary of the fall of the wall. Thank you very much indeed, and goodbye. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Bob. Bye. Thanks so much.